Hello, I'm Erica Maslan and I'm a member of Contra Costa NOW, that is the National Organization for Women. And today I have the pleasure of meeting with Phyllis Pratt, who is a walking encyclopedia when it comes to suffragettes. And since it is the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, meaning women finally were allowed to vote, we are celebrating that. And I am going to interview Phyllis. Hello, Phyllis. Hello, Erica. How are you today? Welcome to our garden. <laughs> so I have a question for you. Well, I have several, obviously. I have a whole long list of questions. <laughs> But my first question is, if you had the ability to time travel, think about that for a moment, to which time and place in the history of the suffrage movement would you transport yourself? And why? Okay. <clears throat> I think I would go right back to the very beginning, <clears throat> to the two-day conference in July 1848, uh, to the conference in Seneca Falls, New York. And why? Because it was so radical for the time. That's interesting to think of this as a radical idea yeah. today. True. But I, I understand it was extremely radical. Mm. And as we will find out in a horrible way too. Mm. So who would you most have wanted to meet? And how did this conference come about in the first place? Um, well, I would like to meet the organizers of the conference, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott. And it came about, the suffrage movement actually came out of the abolitionist movement. Mm -hmm. uh, many of the members were Quakers and uh, were very active in anti-slavery. So Mr. and Mrs. Stanton and Mr. and Mrs. Mott, off they went to London for this anti-slavery conference uh, they were all delegates and, of course, expected to be treated equally, but no, not the <laughs> case. The women were separated from the men, totally separated. Uh, I've read two accounts. One said that uh, the women were forced to sit in the back and to the side, out of the sight of men. They wouldn't want to think women were there. And the other one was they were seated in a balcony behind a curtain. Yes. I wonder if they peeked. And Yes. <laughs> Yes, so they decided then and there, the uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott, they needed to have a women's conference uh, convention to mm -hmm. discuss these things. And this was a two-day conference? I'm not sure. I think it may have been in London. It okay. was in Seneca Falls was a right. two-day conference. So how many attended that The conference? Seneca Falls? Uh, about 300 mm -hmm. uh, women and men, although the first day only women were, were allowed to attend. Uh, the second day men were allowed in. So women turned um, <laughs> the cards a little. A little bit, yes they did. And told them to stay away. Stay on away the first, the first day. day. Okay. Was this where the Declaration of Sentiments was um, presented? It was. Um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton uh, was a beautiful writer. She, she did lots and lots of writing and she wrote the Declaration of Sentiments which was based on the Declaration of Independence and it called for there was a list of 12 or 13 items it called for marriage equality uh, change in divorce laws which of course everything went to the husband inheritance laws everything went to the husband even if she brought an inheritance into the marriage it became her husband's child custody always the men always got um, always got uh, custody. The very last item was the most radical. Uh, it called for women's suffrage, and that was very, very controversial. Um, and Frederick Douglass, so it must have been the second day, uh, uh, spoke very eloquently in favor of the passage. And uh, Mr. Stanton, Elizabeth Cady Stanton's husband, said if she included that last item, uh, he would not attend the conference. Well, she did and he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so it barely passed, but it did pass. But it did pass. It did pass, became part of Much it. Much to his chagrin, I would imagine. <laughs> exactly. 
So um, Susan B. Anthony was not at that convention, was she? She was not. Um, she and Elizabeth Cady Stanton actually met a few years later oh. mm, and became lifelong friends. Unfortunately, neither one of them lived long enough to see the amendment pass. Mm -hmm. It was actually called, it became known as the Susan B. Anthony Amendment. How old would they have been? If they um, had been alive when the amendment oh, passed in well, 1920. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, because uh, I, I think it was, um, I believe Elizabeth Cady Stanton died first in 1906 and Susan B. I think in 1909, something like that. So, mm -hmm. And they were up there in years too mm -hmm. at that time. So fast forwarding a little, um, when did the militant movement begin in the United States? Because it all started, sounds like, in England. It did. It did. Um, Emmeline Pankhurst and her three daughters found, you know, they were just tired of being nice and asking nicely for mm -hmm. the vote and decided something more radical, more militant should be done. So they founded the Women's Political and Social Union, the WSPU. Mm -hmm. um, it was known, and they they really were militant. They they burnt churches and poured acid on golf courses and mm -hmm. uh, harassed members of parliament and did all kinds of things to bring attention to the fact that women were were half of the population, but yet not allowed to participate. Um, so to protest, they did you know all these protests, and they were uh, arrested uh, and sent to prison and were forcibly fed. And back in that day, postcards were very popular. People communicated by postcards. They were cheap to send. And here are some examples of terrible postcards dealing with forcibly wow. feeding. They were fed a mixture of raw eggs and milk, and they were held down. They actually put a tube through the nose. Oh, it was horrible down through the nose into the stomach and then they sometimes it was a thin gruel that they poured in other times it was this mixture of raw egg and milk oh this is horrible this is uh, and oftentimes horrible. the women of course vomited uh, right after well i'm was, amazed that they didn't kill them i'm i'm surprised too i mean there were so many things that could have gone wrong puncturing the esophagus or whatever you know it just could have been oh my god yeah it was it was it was pretty horrible. Oh, this is disgusting. I'm mm -hmm. sorry. Oh. So I see you're wearing um, a medal. Yes. And and that's in the colors of purple, green, and white. Mm -hmm. And um, so tell us about it. Um, when these British women uh, were um, subjected to hunger striking and, and, and forcibly feeding, they were awarded, when they got out of prison, they were awarded one of, uh, awarded one of these um, hunger strike medals. By whom were they awarded? The WSPU, Women's Social and Political Union, okay. Mrs. Pankhurst okay. Group. And this one belonged to uh, Edith Downing, how it ever got out of her family's possession. <laughs> but. I'm very lucky to have it, and it was presented in this case, which oh. reads, presented to Edith Downing by the Women's Social and Political Union in recognition of a ga gallant action, uh, where, whereby through endurance to the last extremity of hunger and hardship, a great principle of political justice was vindicated. And Edith Downing uh, was a sculptor and she actually sculpted this piece, oh um, which I was very lucky to find in London. And on the bottom, <laughs> in this very old penmanship, is stuck together with cello tape. It reads, work of Edith Downing, which she sold in aid of suffragette cause. It's really quite lovely. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah. And we are drinking tea out of these beautiful cups. Tell us. Tell us about those. Um, that was also sold in aid of the suffragette cause in 1909 at the big women's uh, exhibition in Hyde Park. And Sylvia Pankhurst, who was an artist, designed the angel motif, which is also this pendant that our same dealer found uh, 
Jim was a good customer of hers. <laughs> um, and that was sold uh, in aid of the suffrage cause. It's like the centerpiece of our collection. So was Alice Paul at that um, exhibition? I'm not sure, but she was in London from 1906 to 1909. So she very well could have been. I suspect if she was in London, she would have been at that exhibition. Mm -hmm. It was massive. And what was her role in the movement when she came back to the United States? She first joined, see if I can get this right, the National American uh, Women's Suffrage Association, um, which was headed by Carrie Chapman Catt. Mm -hmm. um, but again, she found them much too mild for after being with the Pankhursts and seeing what a little more militancy could accomplish. Mm -hmm. So she, um, she got to work. She got to work. She and her <laughs> friend Lucy Burns uh, formed their own organization, which became known as the National Woman's Party. And although she didn't advocate the kind of destruction that the English, her English sisters did, their main protest was called, were called Silent Sentinels. And they had women in their lovely white dresses with their sashes of purple, white, and gold, which were their colors. And they would stand uh, in front of the White House and picket holding posters saying, uh, President Wilson, why are we not allowed to vote? Or, you know, and this went on for a long time and they began to be arrested. And as they were taken away, more women would come and take their place. <laughs> so um, he was, yeah, he was very annoyed at the president. And so the women were taken to this workhouse, which was the conditions were just abysmal. And they were, went, and you know, with wormy food and really bad stuff. So they hunger struck, uh, like their English sisters, and were forcibly fed as well. Was it as awful as that? It was as awful. It was. Wow. Yeah, it was bad. So what was the night of terror? Truly terrifying. Um, in November 1917, 33 women of the National Women's Party were arrested and taken to this workhouse come prison. And um, they were beaten. I don't know why this particular night this happened, but they were badly beaten. Uh, one woman had her arms twisted above her head and then was smashed down on an iron uh, bench, the arm of an iron bench. Not once, but twice this happened to her. Other women were just very, very badly beaten. Many were taken to hospital. It truly was well, yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, a night of terror. Wow. Mm. Wasn't it Alice Paul who organized the March in Washington, D.C. the day before Wilson's inauguration? Yes, it was. That was quite daring, but using the Mrs. Pankhurst's, um, you know, organization skills taken as her own. She organized, she and Lucy Burns organized this huge, huge parade in 1913. So President Wilson arrived at the train station the day before, ready to be greeted, and there was no, no one there. And he was like, what, what, what's going on? And his aides told him, well, everybody's out watching the suffrage parade, which was news to him. Oh, uh, I love so, it. <laughs> so yes, they... Um, and this, this was when, unfortunately, racism again raised its ugly head. And um, the Southern women did not want to march. They refused to march if women of color were allowed to join in their proper delegations. So a compromise was reached uh, that they could march, but at the very end of the parade. Well, Ida B. Wells was a black journalist, very well known and was not about to take that line down. So she stood on the sidewalk and waited for her, for the Illinois delegation to pass. And she just stepped out and joined them. It's like, yes, <laughs> good for her. That was so, smart. And I, I saw a newsreel of way back when, and unfortunately, I don't know who it was, but there was an African-American woman who started out at the end of the parade and she ran all the way <laughs> up to the front. Yeah. Good for her. I don't know who it was, but uh, I, I thought, yes. Well, speaking of racism, <laughs> here are two examples. I just yes. wanted to show you these racist, very racist. This is oh, purported to be Sojourner Truth. And there are two, a, a larger, the same one, and a smaller. But 
I mean, how disgusting is that? Oh my God, look what she's got here. She's got a club. A club. Yeah, she will have the vote, right? Well, you know, I could think of a good use for those clubs. <laughs> I think, oh, I think you're right. Awful. Yeah, they are pretty bad. Oh. Pretty bad. Mm. So, was Tennessee the last state? Or what, what, what happened there? Um, in, by 1920, uh, many, many states had already granted women the right to vote. There were like uh, 35 states? There were, well, not, um, yes, but it, it, yes, there were uh, 35 had, rat had voted to ratify mm -hmm. the amendment. Um, but, and most of them were in the West and Midwest. The Southern states, no, wanted no part of it because they did not want right. um, uh, women, even though the 14th and 15th amendments granted uh, black men the right to vote. Um, of course, Jim Crow laws took care of that too. Right. But um, it, it did come down to Tennessee and the antis uh, published this notice in the Nashville uh, newspaper. Beware, men of the South, heed not the song of the suffrage siren. Seal your ears against her vocal wiles, for no matter how sweetly she may proclaim the advantages of female franchise, remember that women's suffrage means a reopening of the entire Negro suffrage question, loss of state rights, and another period of reconstruction horrors, which will introduce a set of female carpetbaggers as bad as their male prototypes of the 1860s. Do not jeopardize the present prosperity of your sovereign states, which was so dearly bought by the blood of your fathers and the tears of your mothers by again raising an issue which has already been adjusted at so great a cost. Nothing can be gained by woman suffrage and much may be lost. That's the kind of thing that the antis were putting in the newspaper. We need to have an exhibit. <laughs> yes, I think a lot of people don't realize how long the fight went on it was actually 72 and how years ugly and awful it, it was. was ugly and and uh, I mean the racism was was blatant unbelievable mm. so since we're talking about um, Tennessee um, that is um, a name that is dear to my heart. <laughs> And I yes. think you know who that is. I think I do. So do you want to tell us a little about Harry? Yes. Um, the uh, the Senate, the state Senate in Tennessee passed the uh, amendment um, pretty much straight away. And it went to the House and there was just a knockdown, drag out fight. They delayed the vote and delayed the antis, delayed the vote, delayed the vote. We're not going to have it did everything they could think of uh -huh. to delay the vote. So it came, they offered bribes, even though it was during prohibition <laughs> at the Hermitage Hotel where everybody, it was like the hotel in Nashville, both the pro and the anti forces were, were staying there. The antis opened up what was called the Jack Daniels suite mm -hmm. on the eighth yeah, floor. Yeah, that's where mm -hmm. we all got drunk. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, they did. They, there was a lot of whiskey apparently uh, and a lot of money passing hands mm -hmm. and the the pro-suffrage people wore yellow roses and the antis red roses, okay? So finally, they could delay no longer and the vote took place. However, pro-suffrage people knew they were two votes short. The antis were jubilant, absolutely jubilant. They knew they were, defeat was no question in their minds. Mm -hmm. And the, the pro-suffragists, of course, were you know, pretty downtrodden because they, this was like the last chance for this year and that, if ever, if ever they could get that 36th state. So the roll call began in the house and it got to Banks Turner who didn't answer. So they passed on and they got to Harry Byrne who was 24 years old. So there was one man who didn't respond. He did not respond at that time. So Harry Byrne was 24 years old, the youngest member of the legislature, and he had received a letter from his mother. He was wearing a red rose, an anti-red rose mm -hmm. in his lapel. And he got a letter from his mama that morning, which read in part, uh, Dear son, hurrah and vote for suffrage and don't keep them in doubt. 
I've been waiting to see how you stood, but have not seen anything yet. Don't forget to be a good boy and help Mrs. Cat. With lots of love, Mama. Now, Mama was Phoebe Byrne, who was a college-educated suffragist, but she wasn't sure how Harry was going to vote. She was and, smart. She, yeah, uh -huh. so she kind of nudged him. That, red rose. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that letter was delivered to him on the house floor. And so when his name was called, very quietly, he answered, I. And there was this stunned silence. Nobody could believe it. Neither side could believe it. It's like, so now the vote's tied, right? Which means defeat. If it's a tie vote, it goes down. So then Banks Turner, the other hero of the day, stood up and asked to be recognized and said he would like his vote recorded as I. And with that, it was passed. Well, Phoebe. <laughs> I would say in closing our interview, which was a pleasure, thank you so much, I would like to propose a toast to Phoebe Byrne <laughs> and her son, Harry. Hear, hear. <laughs>